Hey guys, Pete here. This will be my Better Call Saul Season 5, Episode 10 Recap and Review. I've got to mention that this will be spoilery. It contains spoilers for everything that's happened in Better Call Saul through Season 5 and also cover events through the entire run of Breaking Bad. If you're not caught up, then this is your chance to turn away. The season 5 finale was titled Something Unforgivable, and it brought what was arguably the best season of Better Call Saul to a close. In doing that, it felt more like a setup for the ending rather than an end, and in this case it worked well, but I wouldn't say it was satisfying. Then again, I'm not sure it would have felt satisfying if any of the major characters whose endings we don't know came to an end either. Overall, I didn't want it to end, but it did. I want answers, but as Mike would say, I'm asking for information I can't have. I like where we are, but I don't like the uncertainty of not knowing when we'll actually get to see the final season. What I do know is Kim and Jimmy have switched places from where we left them at the end of season four. In that closing scene, Kim is surprised to learn that Jimmy had fooled everyone, including her with his passionate speech about the law and his brother in his reinstatement hearing. We watch him walk down the hall emboldened by all the recent events, stopping to turn with a smile to say, it's all good, man. As he goes, we see this shot of Kim as the camera pulls away, where she's looking lost and alone. To make it worse, Jimmy seems to be clueless about how his future wife feels in that moment. In the season 5 finale, the tables are turned. Jimmy is still recovering from the shootout in the desert, and the opening of the episode he finally comes clean about what actually happened, and the couple decide to head to a fancy hotel to distance themselves from the scene of Lalo's unexpected drop-in. Jimmy feels relieved after Mike tells him that Lalo will be killed, but he's far from emboldened this time around. When she comes up with a plan to destroy Howard's career so that they can force Sandpiper to settle, it's Kim who seems to be clueless about where her partner's head is at. The show's co-creator Peter Gould, who directed and co-wrote this episode with Ariel Levine, really leaned into this connection between these two scenes. When Jimmy was walking away, he turned and pointed in Kim's direction with two fingers. When Kim walks away, she turns and makes a finger gun gesture shooting in Jimmy's direction. This time, we watch the camera pull away from Jimmy, and he's the one who looks lost and alone as he sits on the bed trying to wrap his head around what he just heard. The turnaround is surprising but not completely out of the blue. What I really loved about the way it played out inside the episode was watching the progression. When they first came to the hotel, we could tell that they were dealing with what happened in different ways. Kim was up early in the morning, ready to hit the courthouse. Jimmy tries to stop her from going, and we get the sense that he just wants to hide. We can look at their screen time together and apart as an examination of how each of them reacts to this traumatic experience that they just went through together. Kim loads up on cases at the public defender's office before she runs into Howard. Jimmy goes looking for Mike to get answers about how worried they should be. I think the most telling moment for Kim is her laughing in Howard's face after she learns about the bowling balls and prostitutes. It all sounds like small potatoes to a person who just talked her way out of a showdown with a cartel boss. For Jimmy, it's when we see his anger drop as he says, if anything happens to her, to Mike. To be fair, Jimmy probably should be in a worse spot considering his experience in the desert. But by the time they come back together at the hotel, we understand that their heads are in different places. Slip and Jimmy can't help himself when talk turns to a scam, though. Things start out innocently enough with Kim joking about shaving Howard's head, and of course Jimmy knows a much better way to go about it. We see the progression kick in from there, things snowball, and as the tables turn to Jimmy trying to put on the brakes, it all feels inevitable. Even though she's telling herself she's doing it for the right reasons, and the cost is only a career setback for one lawyer, we know that the final price will probably be well beyond whatever worst case scenario she might be thinking. 
We are in the Breaking Bad universe after all, and that's a place where choices come with consequences. Even in my initial reaction of having just watched the episode, there are so many different possibilities flying around in my mind. Questions like, did Kim just break bad? Was this always about Kim breaking bad? Is there something in Kim's history that we don't know about where she's already done this sort of thing? Where does that leave Jimmy? Will he feel responsible? Will he try to protect her? Will a feeling of responsibility cause him to intervene and try to derail their plans in a way to protect her? It opens a lot of doors without really negating the ideas we've already had about where things are heading. I'll come back to that at the end because we still have the whole cartel story to talk about. We learned that after leaving the apartment, Lalo and Nacho did go straight to the border and watch them arrive at Lalo's compound. He's welcomed by his staff, and I instantly feared for all of their lives. Going into this episode, I had a hard time imagining any of the major characters dying. But when the camera lingered on his cook outside of Lalo's home, it just felt like she was a goner. That worked well to set up the ending, and the trip to Don Eladio's with Nacho being able to impress him really had me think thinking Lalo might die. The trip to Don Eladio's really scratched the Breaking Bad references itch. This time around we watched Lalo score some points for the Salamanca family over Gus who came up a little bit short. Lalo gifts Eladio a Magnum PI style Ferrari with a big box of cash in the frunk. Nacho is able to win him over in their conversation which is capped off with a salud. This of course is the title of the Breaking Bad episode where Gus finally gets his revenge against Eladio and the other cartel bosses. Back at Lalo's compound, we see Gus's assassination plot play out. Nacho got a call instructing him to open the back gate. When he goes to do that, Lalo's sitting by the fire drinking a beer. Nacho has to think fast and makes things work by causing a diversion with a frying pan of oil on the stove when he goes inside to get more to drink. Lalo has to do some fast thinking of his own when the assassins show up outside the kitchen. With the help of a human shield, he makes his way to his tunnel that he has in his bathroom. My favorite part of this was him stopping just as he was about to close it. We see that he comes up with his plan to come back in that moment. He knows that they'll try to follow him and uses this to his advantage when he sneaks back into the house. Nacho is able to get away, but he ends up by himself since all the assassins are taken out. In a great shot, Lalo pulls the mask off the guy he burned with the oil and tells him to call his bosses to tell them that the job is done. He looks over and sees the decanter that Nacho had brought out before he gets up. Then he sees the dead body of his favorite cook as he's walking away. As he goes, it looks like the rage is building up inside him as the episode and the season come to a close. And that's where we leave things. Besides that last sequence, it was a mostly subdued episode in comparison to the wild ride that episodes 6 through 9 were. But it's not like things slowed down. Let's look at where all the characters are. Gus, and by extension Mike, will surely be in a tough spot after this. Lalo will know it was Gus that sent these guys, and he's just one favor with Don Eladio. Gus's best option will be to try to pin it on Nacho, but he may run into some resistance from Mike. For Nacho himself, he's going to have to figure out a way to stay alive after fleeing the compound. In the short term, he may be able to get away, perhaps the assassins left a driver or at least their vehicles behind, but what options does he have after that? As for Lalo, beyond the people inside his house, he didn't lose much. His biggest problem is that Gus is in the US and he's wanted there for murder and jumping bail. He'll have to figure out how to deal with Nacho, but his position isn't weakened that much. On the other side of things, Kim appears to be set on going after Howard. She's convinced herself that the good she can do with the money is worth whatever harm they have to hand out in the process of getting it. Howard looks poised to play a much bigger role next season, and I'm not sure he's ready for the fight that he's in for. Jimmy and Kim are a pretty formidable duo when they start working together. When Jimmy mentioned the episode title and saying that it would take something unforgivable to get them to turn on Howard, he quickly followed that up by saying he doesn't deserve that, which is true. 
Howard has his problems. He's not the greatest human being, but his coming to Kim wasn't as much about him as she made it out to be. Howard's concern that Jimmy needs help is actually true. Howard thinks he needs help and he actually does need help. And Howard delivered one of the best lines of the episode when he said, you know who really knew Jimmy? Chuck. And for my money, it's not just because this is a great way to shut down the conversation, but because it highlights Kim's inability to see the situation objectively. Kim got duped by Jimmy in that Mesa Verde meeting, and she decided to solve the problem by getting married. Everything we've seen her do since then has been to prove to herself that this was the right decision. In their private life, she only has the choice of doubling down or walking away. And to this point, we've seen no hints at her leaving. I don't want to sound sour on Kim. I love the character of Kim and the betrayal by Ray Seahorn. Ray Seahorn needs to win an Emmy this year as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying that she doesn't care for Jimmy or that they shouldn't have gotten together, really. I'm just saying that her decision to be all in with Jimmy, coupled with her personality and sense of wanting to solve her problems herself, has me worried. I'm not sure if she's emboldened by getting through the Lalo scare, if she's maybe already been down this road before, or if she's just not able to see the slippery slope in front of her right this moment. I do know that I've always been worried about how Jimmy was going to bring her down, and now I'm worried that she's on the way to doing that herself. We spent all this time wondering when Jimmy would become the guy we knew from Breaking Bad. And at the end of the season, he looks like he's just along for the ride at this point. That in itself may not be satisfying, but how we got to this place surely has been. And the questions that raises are a lot of fun to think about. It's impossible to say for sure how things are going to play out. We got Kim and Lalo both picking up a head of steam heading towards the finish line. Jimmy has his concerns with Kim's plans although he'll likely jump in with both feet once the scam gets going. It'll be interesting to see what Lalo expects him to do and how much enthusiasm he brings along with him. We're at the end for now, but it feels more like a pause. Hopefully, it won't take two years until we get to find out how it ends. But even in the worst case scenario, it'll probably be worth the wait. There were so many great small details in this episode. I'm just going to point out two. When she's making the Sunday, at first Jimmy says he wants everything. And then he asks her to take out the mint chip, which was the same flavor he had in the ice cream cone when Nacho came to pick him up to introduce him to Lalo for the first time. Another one almost feels like a troll from the writers. There's been all this discussion about the fact that Jimmy's still terrified of Lalo when we first meet him in Breaking Bad. That's made people think that he might still be alive. Later in the series, Gus tells Hector that the Salamanca name dies with him, indicating that Lalo's dead. At the end of this episode, Lalo made the assassin call Gus, which at least in the moment would probably believe him. So the water gets even muddier because it turns out now that Gus could actually be wrong whenever he thinks he's dead. I do think this was the best season of Better Call Saul to date. Season 3 had been my favorite, and I think this topped it because the two sides of the story finally came together. I loved Chuck as a character and missed him once he was gone, but I feel like the focus on bringing Kim and Lalo front and center really pays off. Of course, it's all built on the character work that they've been doing in the lead up, so on some level, it just feels like they're getting better as they go along. The writing, acting, and filmmaking are all incredibly good at the moment. Like I said in my Lalo video, I do believe bringing his character in at the end of season four brought life back into the cartel side of the story. And with him bringing Kim into that side, it really feels like we're approaching an end to the series. And even though the focus wasn't on Jimmy at the end, it was still a great season for the character. He got married, he became a friend of the cartel, and he even drank some of his own pee. In some ways, they've only been putting off the inevitable with him, but I can't really think of a glaring example of something that was not essential that happened this season. Bob Odenkirk has always been great, and I think he's outdone himself in this season. My quick take after finishing the episode was that Jimmy will do something to sabotage their plans to take down 
down Howard. That could save Kim from going all the way down, but their relationship would likely fall apart. If that were the case, then there'd still be hope that they could be reunited in the Gene timeline, or at least get some closure. And I think I need to end it there. I will be making another Better Call Saul video this week, probably a questions video like the big questions we have at the end of season five. I may also do a season five recap for the whole thing so that we have that to go back and watch when the new season comes out. I do want to hear what your questions are in the comments, what you thought about the finale, what you thought about the season, and where you think things are going. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. I will talk to you soon.